Hello everyone, and welcome back to my series on examining original 18th century and early 19th century waistcoats. So I, over time, have built up a little bit of a collection of original waistcoats. Luckily, being in Europe, you can sometimes pick them up. I've also been gifted one or two by friends or pointed in the right direction, and generally I've been very, very lucky. These sorts of things you can still sort of get at auctions and everything, um, and it's a real privilege to have them in my collection so that I can examine them, understand, and then of course share their secrets with you. So the waistcoat I'm going to look at today is slightly later than the one I looked back at in part one. Also, you'll notice that I'm wearing a brand new waistcoat. Thank you very much. This is my convalescence waistcoat, which I hand sewed completely over quarantine, lockdown and everything to regain strength and movement in my arm. I'm doing really well with my arm, but it's just still a little weak and a little bit sore sometimes, but I'm getting along no problem. And also, I'm going to point out the flex of matching buttons. Right, let's check out this waistcoat, shall we? Now let's have some ASMR. waistcoat front you can see here with embroidery going around the edges along the bottom and along the pocket with the back being of linen this is a label um, Ungile Ancienne AR uh, which basically means that it was sold at some point that was a label put onto it bit of a close-up of the embroidery but let's see how many buttons there are, shall we? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So that's one less than the other one I've shown you. And you can see a little seam there, and I think that's from where the embroidery was sort of cut to make the waistcoat. The design goes all the way around and then it gets very elaborate by the pockets with these sort of swag type designs which are incredibly common and really really popular. And then it goes to a point and here you can see it's been tacked down because I've got a theory I think that this has been sort of framed or hung up at one point to sort of show off the embroidery. See so you can see those tack stitches are holding it in place against the back. And those small stitches, they're just ordinary running stitches in silk thread, which keep the piece together. And up there you can see a bar tack. Now, bar tacks, of course, being used on buttonholes as well, and the seam popping up again. The swag design is really interesting because it's like the bottom of the waistcoat is reverse of the pocket design itself. All these lovely flowers. Now this is something called polychrome embroidery, I believe. See, and there's that seam and it goes all the way along the pocket. And it's a really good way of keeping it all together. And I think it's possibly a design for a later one, but to make it more up to date, they shortened it. With then repeating floral embroidery all along the front of the waistcoat. With piecing up by the shoulder. Now it's pretty much a straight line until you get to this piece where you need to add a little bit more and rather than cut the fabric they decide to add a piece. Let's look a bit closer at some of this amazing embroidery. Now what's interesting is that this whole thing, apart from a few little twirly French knots, the whole thing is just ordinary straight stitches. So this is something given a bit of time that you could potentially do yourself. Just look at that. The buttons are lovely as well. And it's amazing that the colours have remained so vibrant for so long. And as you can see, on this button side, there's a little bit of extra fabric popping so, so that, um, you know, you've got a bit of a stand for the buttons. Now let's look inside the pocket. 
the sort of curved design you expect, and the embroidery design of the pocket looping around as well. Lined in linen, and just top stitched in place. Very nice. Probably a bit of a glazed linen actually, it has a very very smooth, smooth feel to it. Now let's look at the inside of the waistcoat. See, and here you can see the back of the stitches that have that little paper label kept on. And there's double rows of stitching around the neck, as you can see along here, which help to secure the edge and stitch it all in place and just give it a bit more security. After all, it's a curve. Now here you can see where the silk has worn away. Um, and you can have a little peek at the button stand, which is a piece of folded linen, which is folded along one side, uh, with the folded side put towards the edge of the material. And it's there to sort of give body to the buttons and keep them in place. And where my finger is at the top and bottom there, you can see the difference between the button stand and the linen interfacing, which goes all the way up. The stitching on the edge is actually just a running stitch with the occasional back stitch. Um, because after all, these these things weren't expected to take a huge amount of wear. See, and you can see some of the piecing of the interfacing underneath there. But what is interesting is that the silk facing isn't pieced at all. It's cut out as one singular piece. Generally, from ones that I've seen before, they tend to be cut in some way and there appears to be a join, because that just saves on fabric. But clearly it wasn't much of a thing. Now down the bottom it's really worn away so you can actually see there's the pocket bag and then there's the underside of the embroidery. It's a mess. Very much like 2020. Just a complete mess. It's really tricky to focus with this. The camera was not happy with me. And if you just look on the left of the screen you, you can see little tabs and that's sort of where the um, where the curvature of the pocket bag is sort of placed down. Now, let's get the lens in there and have a wee look, shall we? Come with me and you'll be inside an 18th century waistcoat. Do do do. Look at it. See, and over there you can see the interfacings, which is great. Um, and the stitching sort of keeping it in place. Yeah, hey. Um, and here, the bar tack at the back, here you have a linen patch, um, which is just there as reinforcement. It's not so much a patch, it's sort of keeping that very vulnerable place together. Good old fashioned underarm staining, which you just get, you know, pe people sweat, deal with it. Now, this is a dark little spot, orangish in colour, so it could be rust, but I'm just going to say it's blood because I can. Uh, and here, the bit of piecing you've got here has actually got a bit of embroidery on it, so it's cut from another piece and sort of flipped around any sort of scrap that's being used. So I've got a few theories about what it's for, and I think it's meant to be... I think that little section of embroidery was maybe meant to be a sort of facing for the top, um, or maybe a collar of some sort. Um, but it's really tricky to know. that There's no real way of knowing. And then it's just, the, the whole thing is really put together with lots and lots of hand-stitched silk thread in a running stitch, mainly. See, there you can see the bulge of the button stand. Vitally important for a waistcoat. You have them on waistcoats, coats, anything that's going to take strain with buttons. Now, let's look at the left side. It's like totally the same as the right side, except different. So the same sort of piecing at the shoulder, but this bit is two bits of piecing with, I don't know if you can see, but just at, just at the top there's that little pink fleck. So they've basically used some scrap fabric which has like one stitch of embroidery on and have used that. Now here you can see quite clearly the double stitching again around the neck and just see how vibrant the colors are. And here you can see where the interfacing is, where it's pressed, been pressed against the silk for so long. Now 
Now, let's count the buttonholes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But there are twelve buttons. Why is this? This doesn't make sense. Why? Why? Oh yeah, because of fashion. So you've got two at the top, so it creates a nice bowed effect to it. You might not even have done it all the way up to the top. Very much how fashion depends. And let's see if I can get you a nice up-close shot of the buttonholes. Come on. God, the camera was not liking this. There we go. Now, this is a buttonhole stitch. Um, it's basically a type of blanket stitch, really, but just minute and small. The same sort of stitching on the edge. It's just lots and lots of straight stitches with the embroidery, but the buttonholes are a separate thing. I'll do a video to sort of show you how those go. You know, I'm still not... I don't think I'm perfect at them yet. You know, there's still a long way to go. You look at originals and you go, wow. See, completely draconian. They just went right through the fabric. Hiya! Hiya! You just cut straight through that flower. No mercy. Poor flower. That flower survived. That one is sadly lost. Nice little leaves as well. Now, I was speaking uh, with a gardener friend of mine who told me rather reliably that all of these little motifs and everything are, in fact, just flowers. Yeah, no real meaning. No, just flowers. Nice sort of swags again. So they're both exactly the same, both sides. And this would have been how you would have gone to uh, the embroiderer. You would have had them make them up like this. It was just a very standard common practice. And you have the side again with the same little bar tack. So the back thing has a bar tack as well as the buttonholes of a bar tack. It adds strength and keeps things together. It's basically a small buttonhole, really, but with no hole. Nothing more to report about the pocket, really, apart from the fact it's exactly the same. I quite like how the embroidery on the off chance has sort of continued on above the pocket. That's quite nice. Now, if we take a look up at the piecing here, so you can clearly see the piecing, but it's plain. There's no embroidery uh, on this one, but there are a few tacking stitches still keeping it in place, so I'm not going to really disturb those. Leave us alone. Don't disturb us. We're just tacking stitches. Wow. Just... Wow. Just imagine a room filled with people wearing this sort of thing. All the bright embroidery and colours. It would have been spectacular. Oh, and there's the reinforcement patch on the other side, as you can see. Now, let's look at the inside. Nothing, nothing really to report, because it's exactly the same. You just have the back of the buttonholes on this side. Now, there's no button stand on this side, obviously, because there are no buttons. It's simply just buttonholes. And you don't want to cut through or sew through too many layers with a buttonhole. They just don't end up being as successful, it seems. There's a little bit of wearing along the bottom, as is to be expected, um, but really not enough to sort of look into too much. You can just see the bottom of the pocket bag there as the silk has worn away. And as, yep, and here is the back sort of where it folds over. Which wouldn't have been the original intention, but there you are. And then there's the patch. See, one piece, which is quite interesting. But you can see where it's pressed, and you can see the edge of the pocket bag and the interfacing, which keep it all together, as well as the curve of the pocket itself. Stain again, but no blood spot. I've decided it's blood. Can't tell me otherwise. See, once again, those little threads of the piecing and everything that I just won't disturb. Armhole, put together in the same way as the other side. Now let's look at the back. This has been split at one point um, because history, people do weird stuff. Now at the top, 
there's a doubling over of fabric, uh, of linen, because after all, there's no collar to keep the tension there, so an extra bit of fabric can really help sort of keep things together. It's of a linen, I'd say, um, single layer, with the layers sort of, you know, whip-stitched under, um, sort of felled, to be precise. At some point, it's been ripped apart on the back to fit someone, well, pretty much my size, to be honest. Well, slightly larger. Now, that, that set of ties aren't original. They don't look right. This is the sort of thing they would have had. And ties are completely appropriate and would have been there anyway. Now, you see those little kicks yep, here and here? Those would have sort of gone together and then flipped over, so it's almost like the back of a tailcoat. And that would have sort of helped sort of keep things together so you can even see the stitches where it was originally now i've thought about maybe returning it to its original form but i feel that these changes over time are part of its history and part of its material culture here we're looking at the inside of the lining as in the bit right against your body and the way in which the back is created it's a sort of felled it i I can't really think of the right sort of name for it, but it's where the edges are sort of tucked into each other and then sewn, sort of whipped down. It's very, very effective. And then with the kick at the back, you have the very selvage of the fabric itself, the selvage of the linen. No, no fluffy edges. And the bottom just whipped up, and you can see the lines of the stitching, and there is the bar tack here. and here with the patch as well, so it's the same on both sides. And it's ever so slightly longer than the waistcoat itself. That's the back. So this has been you looking at a waistcoat. Now, time to put it away And I'll introduce you to another one and further details next time. So I hope you enjoyed that look at the secrets of the 18th century waistcoat and the colourful embroidery and all of that. And if you've got any questions or something you want explained or looked at in the next one, write down in the comments and let me know. But which one of my videos would be complete without a cocktail today? I will be making the bijou. I know, sounds really fancy. Don't really know much about the history. So there we go. What you will need for this is you will need sweet vermouth, green chartreuse, gin, and angostura bitters. I like to call it angry sorry bitters because, because it's more fun to say. So, what you want is you want to take your Jane Austen glass, um, other authors are available, put a few dashes of the Angry Sorry Bitters in there, one and a quarter ounces of gin. My review of getting the tops back on aviation gin bottles, not good. One and a quarter ounces of sweet vermouth. And then your green chartreuse, which is fascinating. It has been made by monks in France um, for hundreds of years, you know, since sort of 1605, so that's some time away. And they're the only place that make it. They make green and yellow chartreuse. It's fantastic, it's wonderfully aromatic, it's something to be appreciated. So this is my second bottle. Three quarters of an ounce of green chartreuse. You want to have a dash of water in there as well, you know, about a quarter of an ounce. Um, I put a little bit in beforehand. And then you just want to put ice in. And then you just give it a stir. I do it until the glass is visibly and feels very, very cold. Put a sieve on. You can use a spoon and then pour into your glass. You would then garnish uh, with a proper, you know, French or Italian maraschino cherry. Um, I do not have one. Chin chin. Mm. Now, if you do want to drink, then you can go for this. 
and I think alcohol should be enjoyed, appreciated and respected. Be safe everyone, this is a tricky time in the pandemic, but we'll get through it. Now rather fortuitously, this waistcoat actually fits me. Now, I would say don't try this at home, but if you have an original waistcoat, maybe try it. Um, I did go through a lot of processes to think, is it strong enough? But I think it really helps for you to see how it fits on the body and the sort of silhouette it gives. I know, don't hate me for the fact I'm not wearing proper 18th century, I'm wearing later, but I didn't have the right outfit on me. But yeah, there we go. Thanks everyone for tuning in.